welcome to Trinity United Church. Are there any announcements that need to be made by anyone in the community? We'll have some, we'll have some, well, discussion time and, and learning time to get together today, so I'll have a chance to, and maybe some time to talk afterwards. So I've got a little bit of work for you to do as you've discovered as you came in the, uh, in the doors today. But as we begin our time of worship together, let's take a moment to greet one another, giving a wave, giving a nod, turning around, and saying hello to those who are joining us online as well. Our services are recorded so that um, they can be edited and uploaded to our YouTube channel so that you can view them uh, at a later time or share them with friends and family who may uh, appreciate being part of this community as well. We have a candle lighter, I believe, today. When we gather to worship, we light a candle. Candle is a reminder of the light of Christ, the light of Christ which shines in our midst when we gather and shines in that virtual place between us when we are gathered virtually and those who join us online, and it shines in our hearts as well. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. God of faithful surprises, throughout the ages you have made known your love and power in unexpected ways and places. May we daily perceive the joy and wonder of your abiding presence and offer our lives in gratitude for all that we have received. Amen. Our opening hymn, it's found in More Voices at number 145, Draw the Circle Wide.
three years ago, around this time of the year, this was the opening hymn for our service of worship. And that was the Sunday, I'm going to say October 20th, that date sound, sticks in my mind, when we became an affirming congregation officially. And so today we're celebrating the third anniversary of that occasion. I'll turn that over to, uh, to Kathy Campbell to uh, guide us through um, what we've been doing, what we will be doing, and some celebration of that. Thank you. Good morning. Again, I'm here on behalf of the Affirming Working Committee, but also on behalf of the congregation, because we didn't do this alone. Um, I'll just do a quick review of the process and share a story with you. Um, but yes, there's lots of people that were involved, some that are still with us, um, some that have moved on or have changed committees. Um, so we want to uh, acknowledge and thank everybody. Uh, we've had people with uh, visible signs of affirming and participation in the discernment process. So you'll notice on the screen here, the logo um, for Affirm United or S'affirmer Ensemble. And the, lo the logo was created by Joyce Cosby and it reflects the Christian fish that is integral to both Christianity and the United Church of Canada logo, and it unites both the cross and the rainbow. It's an important reflection of Affirm United's belief that God's love includes all, and that the church must welcome all. And since we are an affirming congregation, we can display and use this logo. But how did we become an affirming congregation? When I reflected on this, I think we started our journey about seven or eight years ago, actually, and a few ministers ago, but we really began our discerning process with Stephen near the end of 2017. In order to become an affirming congregation, there was a formal process to follow. So here are some of the highlights. Making public commitments. We created a vision statement in 2019, an equal marriage policy, an action plan, and we've actually been expanding our action plan in an ongoing nature uh, towards becoming an anti-racism church and um, recognizing and taking action with truth and reconciliation. There were a lot of um, events in the world that have spurred us to action. For example, the deaths of George Floyd and Breonna Taylor, and that led our group into uh, an increased focus on um, learning about systemic racism, as well as the anti-Asian response after COVID. We made our decision June 23rd, 2019 with an overwhelming yes. And then part of the process is making a commitment to the national affirming movement because God loves all. And this uh, movement believes in working for the full inclusion of all sexual orientations and gender identities in the United Church of Canada and society. And it encompasses education, action, and support. And then after our vote on October 19th, 2019, we celebrated. We celebrated in two ways. On the Saturday, we hosted a fun drag show hosted by me and my drag daughter, Ivy Leak along with some special guests, and we had um, a question and answer period after that. And then on the Sunday morning, the 20th, uh, we became officially affirming when Gary Simpson presented our affirm certificate. Since that time, we strive to be public, intentional, and explicit, pie, and this means offering more than just a welcome, declaring that all sexual orientations and gender identities are a gift from God, making safe spaces, celebrating God's, God's gift of diversity and seeking justice. Right now, there are over 100 ministries in the affirming process and over 200 affirming ministries in communities of all kinds in every part of Canada. So right now, that makes over 300. This includes churches, regional councils, educational institutions, education and retreat centers, church courts, and in Edmonton, assisted living home an assisted living home and some outdoor ministries. Here you can see some of the visual symbols of our work and what we believe. We are currently considering how we can represent our work and focus on anti-racism learning and intentions um, over the past few years somewhere in our sanctuary as well. So some of the highlights over the last year, we've uh, acknowledged and celebrated Black History Month 
we've shared information about the 40 days of engagement on anti-racism. We had a pie celebration, which they call National Affirming Day. We talked and learned about Asian Heritage Month, Pride Month, National Indigenous Peoples Day, National Truth and Reconciliation Day. That's what we've done so far in 2022. And still to come, we have our Trans Day of Remembrance, World AIDS Day, and the UN International Day of Persons with Disabilities. So these are some of the things we are working on. So I'd say we're a small but mighty group um, and always working, keeping these things in mind um, as an affirming congregation. So what I'd like to do at this point is our church may not look exactly like that right now. But I think here at Trinity, we embrace people in love and faith where God's doors are open to all. Today is a busy day, so we remember our affirming, becoming an affirming congregation. We, we lit these candles three years ago. I have them standing up in a bucket of sand, so I certainly hope they don't fall over. This one is tilting a wee bit. Today is also our celebration of All Saints Day, All Saints Sunday. When we gather, remembering someone who has passed away, someone who has died, of our community, of our, of our area. I often invite families to bring a candle to light. Just as we light our candle at the beginning of worship, we light a candle in those times of memorial to remember the light of that person's life and the light of Christ, which is part of our lives as well. So today we've lit candles, our candle that we light in worship, but also these candles to celebrate being affirming, to celebrate being, to celebrate the saints around us. For all the saints who went before us, who have spoken to our hearts and touched us with your fire, let us say together, we praise you, O God. We praise, we praise you, O God. For all the saints who live beside us, whose weaknesses and strengths are woven with our own, we praise you, O God. For all the saints who live beyond us, who challenge us to change us, to change the world with them, we praise you, O God. I invite you to take some time listening for the Spirit as you remember the saints of your life. The saints you remember, those whose stories burn bright. Take a moment, remember them, and give thanks. And then we'll sing. Seven blessed are they.
first reading this morning from the second letter of Paul to the Thessalonians. Paul, Silvanus, and Timothy, to the church of the Thessalonians in God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. We must always give thanks to God for you, brothers and sisters, as is right, because your faith is growing abundantly, and the love of everyone of you for one another is increasing. Therefore, we ourselves boast of you among the churches of God for your steadfastness and faith during all your persecutions and the afflictions that you are enduring. To this end, we pray, to this end, we always pray for you, asking that our God will make you worthy of his call and will fulfill by his power every good resolve and work of faith, so that the name of our Lord Jesus may be glorified in you and you in him, according to the grace of our God and the Lord Jesus Christ. This ends the first reading. The Gospel this morning is from Luke chapter 19, verses 1 through 10. Jesus entered Jericho and was passing through it. A man was there named Zacchaeus. He was the chief tax collector and was rich. He was trying to see who Jesus was, but on account of the crowd he could not because he was short in stature. So he ran ahead and climbed a sycamore tree to see him because he was going to pass that way. When Jesus came to the place, he looked up and said to him, Zacchaeus, hurry and come down, for I must stay at your house today. So he hurried down and was happy to welcome him. All who saw it began to grumble and said, He has gone to be the guest of one who is a sinner. Zacchaeus stood there and said, and said to the Lord, Look, half of my possessions, Lord, I will give to the poor. 
And if I have defrauded anyone of anything, I will pay back four times as much. Then Jesus said to him, Today salvation has come to this house, because he too is a son of Abraham. For the Son of Man came to seek out and to save the lost. This is part of our sacred scripture. Thanks be to God. It has been less than two months since we have experienced a change in the sovereign within the Commonwealth. All of my life, I've had the Queen as the head of state, the official head of state. And it's still a little odd for me to see references to King Charles in the present, not 500 years ago or whatever it was. And I've yet to be in a situation when we sing God Save the King, although, be that as it may, we less and less common for us to sing that anthem in any situation, whether to a queen or a king. But at the time of her passing, one of the common topics of conversation that I heard on call-in shows and things like that were occasions when someone had met the queen or corresponded with the Queen, or had even just seen the Queen. Now, I don't really know what the appeal is to see a Queen, or for that matter, for a King. I know, though, that people in those occasions would speak about her charm and her presence. People would speak about being in the presence of someone and something larger than themselves. They knew that the queen, now the king, was representative of the governance and of the realm. Just to set eyes upon the sovereign is to see beyond just that person. I won't get into it and, and going beyond the opinions of continuing a monarchy, and that is a live topic these days. Maybe, though, there is something for us to help us understand why Zacchaeus was so keen simply to see Jesus. It may have simply been curiosity, but it may have been more than that. We wonder, as Zacchaeus climbed the tree to see Jesus as he came into Jericho, was he hoping to see something more than just a person? Was he hoping to see something more? The story of Zacchaeus has always been an, uh, an interesting one for me. Do you remember singing a song in Sunday school about Zacchaeus? Or teaching a song in Sunday school about Zacchaeus? I, something rings in my mind about that, but I can't remember the details of it. But even as a child, and maybe it was because... A child identifies with the story because Zacchaeus was, of course, short in stature, and children are always shorter than the adults around them. Maybe it was fun to think of climbing up something as exotic as a sycamore tree. But I always remember the story of Zacchaeus and the promise that he made to Jesus. I will give half of everything that I have to the poor, and if I have cheated anyone, I will pay back four times what I cheated. What a, a tale of a turnaround in a person's life. Such, such a turnaround. But wait, there's more. Do you remember last week, if you were part of our service together or watched it on video or read it, that we had the story, one of Jesus' stories, one of his parables, of the Pharisee and the tax collector. And we discovered that the way one particular word from the original language was translated, it could change everything about that story. Well, that's happened again. This time we're looking at the English translations, and they don't 
all agree. The version which we heard today is a promise of future behavior. I will give half that of what I have, and I will repay four times for anyone that I have cheated or defrauded. But other translations, very common translations that we have, will say, I give half of what I have, and I repay four times. So is Zacchaeus speaking of the future, or is he speaking in the present? I wondered if that makes a difference, but maybe it really doesn't make a difference. You see, here we, we have this distinction here between is Zacchaeus making a promise, or is he defending himself? In a sense, though, you could say the outcome is the same. His wealth, which was considerable is now being shared with those who were less fortunate. And the corruption of the tax system, which we understand from our study of that time period, was very corrupt, very unjust, was being shown up for what it was, because he says, I will pay back if I've defrauded anyone. On that day in Jericho, Zacchaeus, wanted to see Jesus. And as it turned out, Jesus saw Zacchaeus. Maybe that simple turnaround turns everything around. The crowds were grumbling, and we can understand some of what they were thinking and saying. Zacchaeus was indeed a tax collector. He was the head of tax collector in the town. And aside from nobody wants to pay taxes, something hasn't changed about that in centuries, it wasn't just that people didn't want to pay taxes though. Although he was small in stature, he stood for more than just himself. He was in fact the figurehead of the empire's oppressive tax system. He was the figurehead, he was the person for the empire itself. Why would Jesus give him any attention? But Jesus saw Zacchaeus. Lives are changed when Jesus sees us. The crowds grumbled. Grumbled that Jesus would pay attention to Zacchaeus. And more than just himself, Zacchaeus was the oppressor. He was the empire that always kept them down. He was the face of the empire, which was never their friend. Zacchaeus was not someone to whom you would give the benefit of the doubt. It seems that when Jesus sees us, the world may change. It may well be that Zacchaeus changed, changed his outlook, changed his response through his work. Maybe he was indeed suddenly repentant and caring about those who were poor and paying back those whom he had cheated. That's great. Maybe also we can look at it as saying our own outlook has changed and we can see Zacchaeus in a different way a way like we had not seen him before. See him as someone who can, in fact, be generous, someone who can do the right thing when others are cheated. When Jesus sees us, lives are changed. Would that we could see Jesus as Zacchaeus sought to see Jesus. Would that we could see Jesus so that Jesus could see us. Of course, we do not see Jesus walking down the street shaded by a sycamore tree. Yet today, in our worship, we acknowledge that we have seen Jesus in the life and the love, in the service and the ministry of others. 
We've acknowledged our third anniversary of being an affirming congregation. For all those people in the diverse community of sexual orientation and gender identity, we see Jesus in their struggles and their patience, in voices raised and marches held, when barriers have been broken and love can be celebrated and identity honored. We see Jesus. Today also, we remember the saints who have gone before us. Those of our community, our church, our own circles of acquaintance, who have gone before us and shown us the way in their devotion, in their service, in their love and mercy and hard work, we see Jesus. Just as Zacchaeus wanted to see Jesus, we know and we believe and we trust that Jesus sees us. When Jesus sees us, lives are changed. We continue to look at the call and the vision statement of the United Church of Canada. The three elements of that statement which we've been exploring are deep spirituality, bold discipleship, and daring justice. And last week we began looking at bold discipleship. Disciples are those who learn, and in faith we learn from Jesus. Discipleship builds on the faith, the spirituality which first draws us to Jesus. Discipleship is about always asking, always learning how faith makes a difference. We hold the faith that we are loved by a loving and merciful God. How will we show love in response? We hold the faith that we are seen by Jesus. Jesus sees our faith and our faults and still calls us. How will we give our hearts to Jesus by honoring and serving the many, many souls that Jesus sees in our neighbors? Well, maybe on that note, I'll close our exploration of Zacchaeus. We will continue talking about discipleship, and we'll come back to that again. So for now, we say amen, and we join together in singing. And I invite us to join together singing from Voices United at number 595, We Are Pilgrims.
And we thank you for the continuing support of the mission and the ministry of Trinity United Church and of the United Church of Canada through your gifts and your offerings to this congregation and to the United Church of Canada through mission and service. Thank you. Your gifts make a big difference. Let us pray. God of abundance, you have called us to be the church, and so we share our abilities, resources, and love. Committed to the way of generosity, kindness, and grace, we offer ourselves. Receive all we offer today. May each person who is touched by this offering know your love for them. Amen. In response, we sing the verse, What Can I Do? said before I like that I like that song because it asks the question what can I do because there are certainly things that we can do deep spirituality bold discipleship daring justice we've been talking about the call and vision statement of the United Church of Canada and the three related themes that come from that statement deep spirituality, bold discipleship, and daring justice. These three related themes help us to understand our role as the church. Spirituality is the basic building block on which everything rests. Faith assures us that we are loved by God and called by Jesus. We look to Jesus as our guide, as we work out how our faith will make a difference in our lives. So as we were talking about deep spirituality for a couple of weeks, two weeks ago, I, th I think it was, we gathered at a gathering time to talk more about deep spirituality with us and as a congregation. Well, we thought that maybe there'd be a few different ways of gathering information having a gathering, sharing over tables and muffins and coffee is great, but maybe there's other ways to gather information as well. Gather your input so that we have thoughts about how we can shape our goals and our direction for Trinity United Church. So this week, as a change, you've got some post-it notes in your order of service. First piece of information, don't take those home with you. I want you to do a little bit of work right now, and I want you to answer some questions. You may have a copy of those questions, because if you're like me, you know, you say a couple of questions, and you remember one of them, and you forget the other. So I've got them both printed for you. But the two, que the two questions relate to discipleship. The first question, what is a teaching of Jesus or a story of Jesus that touches you most? Why is that? And how does it make a difference in your life? So we've heard a couple of the stories of Jesus. We've heard some parables. You've got lots of other stories of Jesus that you probably remember, both the parables, the stories that Jesus told, but also the stories about Jesus 
interacting with others, etc. All those other things. Think about what's one, and you may have more than one. Hopefully that's the case. But think of one, why is it memorable and how does it make a difference for you? I'll give you a couple minutes to think about that. Write it down. At the end of the service, after we go out, we've got some flip charts in the, in the uh, Narthex area and you can put those on so we have a record of what you've been, uh, what, you, what you've had to offer for us. question is is a personal question it's thinking about yourself and how you relate to discipleship the second question is talking about us as a group as a congregation or a community of faith and so that is what can we do whether it's a task or a gathering of some sort or a practice that we we start or something else that can help us us being the collective to live out our discipleship as a congregation. So we're looking for a goal for us as a congregation in the next year or so. So if there's something that you can think of, like say whether it's a task that we can do, uh, a gathering that we, the, that we share, a practice that we begin that will help us in our collective discipleship.
realize that you may not be finished and um, in a sense we're never finished that task but um, at the end of the service if you'd like to complete those and make sure that they go up on the flip chart so we do have a record and some information to uh, to, to um, help us in going through that just as Beth was playing that I thought of a great I think it's a great idea you should you should all agree with me right that we should have a dance have a dance for that wonderful music that's I was wanting to move <laughs> as she was doing that let us be joined together in prayer our beloved God we give you thanks for all of your gifts to us for daily food for health for each breath we take, for freedom to choose, and for the gifts of your word, your power, and your love. Our hearts are truly overwhelmed, O oh God, when we consider how you have entrusted so much to us. May we be worthy of that trust. May we be a people who are unafraid to live as fully and as richly as you want us to live. Help us, O oh God, as followers of Jesus, to multiply all that you have given us, to risk spreading your word and perhaps see it misunderstood, to gamble by loving those whom others think worthy only of hate, or to take chances by doing good to those who have not done good to us. Help us be faith-filled, and desire to increase your glory and your goodness in the world. Make us people who share in both word and deed that which you have given to us. We pray for the church gathered today, both here and virtually and around the world, that it may encourage all of its members to discover and develop and use all their gifts, those of nature and those of grace. We pray for those who are poor in body or in spirit, for those oppressed and heavy laden, for those sick or in despair. We offer in prayer the time of silence that we keep. In silence, we remember the people that we know who are in need and we remember those persons named in our newsletter as well. We offer, too, the wandering minds that seek to be stilled by your Spirit. Minister, O oh God, by your Spirit and through us to all those for whom we have prayed, and help us walk faithfully in the path of Jesus Christ, whose prayer we say together. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. And let us join together singing a hymn of thankfulness from Voices United at 236. Now thank we all our God. 236.
these words to take us into the coming week. May Christ, who makes saints of sinners, who has transformed those we remember today, raise and strengthen you that you may transform the world. God bless you and keep you now and always. Peace be with you. And let us sing that benediction together.